first very small of you knew, uh, less people. And uh, so this year we are regrowing. So what happens this year in Axe is uh, we, uh, we really got uh, momentum. It's, it's, actually it's, it's important for any technology to get momentum. It's like a cycling. You know, if you stop uh, cycling, you will just fall down. So you need some momentum at some point to be able to just uh, go on. And uh, what brings us momentum is many things, of course, uh, like people getting more and more used to Axe. They know about it. People talking about Axe. Uh, t telling to their friends they should use it, and also like some uh, of the nice uh, community work, uh, such as Enemy. Uh, how many of, of you have, I know about Enemy? Uh, mo mostly all of you. So, well, how many of you are actually using it? Uh, quite a lot. Quite a lot. Yeah. So, Enemy for uh, is a really something I think which is uh, really bringing uh, acts to the to the light in a, for some very uh, typical usage uh, because. Axe is kind of a toolbox. You can do a lot of things with Axe, a lot of different things. But you have to know kind of what you want to do with this uh, at first. So I think this year we, 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 had, we are a bit at the tipping point. Uh, at first, people were saying Axe is cool, but it's just a way to do some things that I already know better. So it's just kind of an enabling to just, OK, for example, I already do, do JavaScript, or I already do Flash. I want to do it better, but the same thing. So I, I will use Axe. Uh, but now it's getting more and more about uh, how to go cross-platform, how to uh, really uh, use Axe to do more things, not, exact, not only to do the same things you are doing already before. So that's really something that's it changing from the people's point of view about Axe. Uh, we got a new axe.org website, which is also something <laughs> great. I mean, uh, thanks to Influxes for providing the design. So well, I mean, we need to do just you know show a new face for people, uh, so that uh, they see okay, oh, there is momentum. There is uh, something which is a uh, really growing technology, and uh, people are more and more interested in that. Uh, so we get many improvements as well on the language side. So that's something we. So, uh, and of course, we still have a very long way to go. Uh, we are not backed by any big corporation like uh, Google or something. Uh, that's something which is uh, maybe make us harder to another way to go. But at the same time, that's also the price for independence, that we are not we are really vendor neutral. We are really agnostic about any platforms. X doesn't come with his own platform. He doesn't say, uh, you have to use this platform. Uh, we are not selling anything. Uh, so it's, I think it's important to be uh, platform neutral as much as possible, and to really uh, to enable acts to be really everywhere uh, without kind of having some kind of hidden agenda to uh, like, uh, purpose, like uh, put uh, forward one given platform. So still a, a lot of way to do. So how do we get there? Uh, first, we, got, we, see the, we saw the past. Let's talk about the present. Uh, the present is now. Uh, so now is like uh, today. Uh, it's time for 2.09, which is a new version of Axe. Uh, so you can, uh, it's now available on axe.org. So you can download it not right now. <laughs> no, don't do it, Dorian. No, you send to me first, and after you can download it. <laughs> so, but it's uh, available on, on Exotalk right now. Uh, one of the major features that we have in uh, 2.09 is a compilation server, uh, which is quite important. Things I will explain how it works. First, you start uh, with a command line. We start the uh, X server in the background, uh, dash V for verbose mode, which you just print some information about what it's doing, and you say, "I will wait on this given port." Uh, so it, it will open a port on your local machine and wait on it. And then when you uh, start a compilation, uh, if you have an XML file or if you want to just to add uh, dash dash connect on your uh, project properties, you specify the same port on your local machine. And what it does is that instead of compiling, uh, what it does, it will send the compilation uh, command commands to the server. So, and the server will compile instead of uh, the uh, same command line. So. The difference is that the server have a l instead of ap once the server has finished compile, instead of just exiting like the like the compiler is doing, it will just keep the things is being compiled in memory in a cache, and this way the next uh, the next time you compile it will re reuse the cache for the part that has not been modified. So this is really a strong improvement for Axe. Uh, so it's not a server that you start on another machine; you are starting it on your own computer. Uh, and you, you get uh, like this a compilation cache directly. Uh, and 
thanks to this, uh, we were able to see uh, two to three times compilation times increase. So that's very var varied depending on the project. Let's say you have like, for instance, a very huge project, but that you only modify some very small part of it every time. Then you get a lot of uh, benefit from the compilation server because you will get, uh, you will only have to recompile the parts that are modified and all the dependencies. So, uh, I mean, all the, if you modify one class and it's used by another class, you will have to recompile both anyway because we have to maintain the, all the links and everything. But if you are using, for example, if you have a set of class, like four class that are like all referencing each other and all your other code is just libraries, then you will just modify this class and all the library will be cached and reused. So it will almost have zero cost at compilation time. So that's something re really huge. Uh, so depending on the project, you can go from two times to three times uh, to up to 10 times faster compilation, thanks to the cache. And uh, one of the great things also is that you get very huge speed up for completion time uh, because completion is handled by the compiler. So if you are using Flash Develop or if you are using like uh, Sublime Text or other like uh, ideas, then uh, usually when you press a dot or when you ask for completion, uh, it's because the act is quite complex. The idea you cannot handle all the completion by itself because you need to know about type inference and how the compiler works and everything. So uh, basically what it does is that it calls the X compiler and asks, I want the completion at this point. And uh, no thanks to the caching, uh, you can get really faster results for completion. And that's something really, 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 really important for us uh, to be able to have very fast completion, whatever the idea. So that's really something. And uh, basically what we are planning, we are uh, talking already with, uh, is Philip there? Philip? From Flash Develop? No? Yeah, that means coming tomorrow. So, uh, he, uh, Philip from Flash Develop is working on uh, integrating uh, the compilation server directly in Flash Develop. So, you will just have to specify in your configuration of Flash Develop your port, and that's it. It will just start the server in the background automatically and connect to it. You don't have to do any configuration. Right now, you still have to start it by yourself and do it like this manually. But in the, in the end, we expect that all the IDE will just do this in the background for you, and you don't have to do any setup. Well, and uh, that's really also for future usage because uh, a lot of things we want to do in the future is to provide like tools for ideas, for refactoring, for uh, being able to go, like, go to target declaration and all these things. All these stuff are idea tools uh, that we could implement in the compiler and thanks to compiler cache, we can go very fast results, almost immediate and really precise results uh, to help idea to really improve the workflow for any ax uh, development. Okay, that's not all. <laughs> we still have a lot of slides to go on. So, uh, one of the things we had in 2.09 was is uh, optional structure files. So basically, when you declare uh, a structure uh, such as uh, this one uh, with two fields, you can have optional fields. Uh, you just had a question mark in front of the name of the field. And what it does is that uh, when you uh, specify a function that takes a field, uh, you can omit uh, the optional fields. And it will just, just like compile well, okay? So that's, I mean, that's quite neat because a lot of uh, in, uh, sometimes libraries, they have all these kind of different parameters you want to pass, but you don't need to pass all of them. They are like a kind of really optional thing, but you still want to pass them as a structure because you have a lot of them, so you need to name them. So this way we can actually like specify what are the very mandatory parameters and what are the op optional ones. The only small thing that it only works when you pass a constant structure. If you pass something, a variable that is typed as it will not, uh, well, it, it will not work if it's just variable which could just contain it because there is kind of uh, issue with it. But so if you work, if you pass a constant structure, it will work. Let's keep that in mind. But that's most of the case anyway in the, for this feature. Another thing we have is like JS JSON fields notation. Uh, so you can write this now in 2.09. So it's enable you to copy paste JSON directly in Axe and it will compile. And you can use also like, like, uh, like, uh, Fields, identifiers that were not uh, already like possible before. Um, well, I'm just clicking. Uh, sorry. Yeah, and uh, well, well, you can access after you type that. You can access the hello field with the dot, dot syntax, but you cannot access the dollar command field with dot syntax because it's not allowed by the language. But you can still access it to reflect dot field or like reflection. So that's one thing to remember. But uh, with these kind of things, you can, for example, when you are doing like some database things such as uh, Redis or stuff like that, you're able to like send requests which require dollars and stuff like that. 
So that's something really nice. Uh, we have a new dead code uh, elimination. We really need to make these parameters slow, like shorter for <laughs> next major release because <laughs> dead code elimination is quite long to write. If you have an uh, idea, just send it to me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so what it does is just uh, dead code elimination. It was present before. Uh, we did a rewrite, which is already a bit better, uh, and uh, kind of treat some corner cases that were not handled before. Uh, dead code elimination. What it does is just it will just make sh uh, compile your program and only uh, compile the parts that are really used. So not only the classes that are used, but actu the actual methods that are used. So if there is a method you are u not using in your uh, in your program. Uh, it will just remove it from the compilation, so it will really reduce the output of your code size. It can be really useful for JavaScript or sometimes for Flash, especially if you are using bi big libraries that with a lot of uh, like methods and a lot of classes, and you are only using, using a very really small part of it. With that code compilation, you only get uh, to compile the parts that you really need. So that's really something uh, useful. Um, it reduces a lot of code size. Uh, but because, of course, we need to kind of uh, figure out only the things that are already compiled, uh, it means that there is no compiler cache for that code compilation, the code elimination. That's the drawback, okay? So you, if you want to use a, a get compiler cache, you it actually when you use that code, com that code elimination, it disables the compiler cache because it requires kind of to recompile everything to make sure you are actually using it or not, okay? That's a, something we maybe we could work uh, on this later, but well. There are also some smart array inference. If you have an array of bash class and two like instance of these uh, subclasses, uh, before it was not compiling this kind of thing because it was saying, uh, it was, but no, it's, it works perfectly, so. Uh, more time libraries. So uh, we have x.fi, which is kind of an API for manipulating string as a because as you know, uh, depending on the platform, string is different. Uh, if it's uh, uh, in JavaScript, it depends on your page encoding. If it's usually it's uh, then it's HFI, but you can also have your page encoded in ISO, then it will be ISO. Uh, in Flash, it's HFI every time. Uh, on Nico or, or by, uh, C++, it's an array of bytes, so it doesn't specify any encoding on the strings. So with this API, you have an API to work with HFI APIs. Not the length, not in bytes, but in characters. Uh, to know, uh, be able to like s get substrings of a string, whatever the platform. So that's something that's also very cool. Um, we have XJSON also uh, in 2.09. Uh, it uses like a, a very like pure ax implementation. So we have flood work, uh, work, uh, work uh, a pure ax implementation. This way you can work exactly the same, whatever the platform. And then we have, of course, uh, we are using native uh, implementation when available. In JavaScript, we do auto detection. If it's available in the browser, we use the native implementation, which is of course a lot faster. And in Flash 11 Plus, uh, we use the native implementation for uh, things. So depending on the plat on the platform, maybe for C++, we will have at some point uh, native implementation as well. Well, if it ma if it uh, makes a difference or not, I'm not, I'm not sure. So this kind of thing, we have one single API, uh, one single way of doing works on all the platforms, and use the native implementation when available. So that's something also nice. Uh, yeah, and you can force, if you want to use uh, exactly the X implementation, you can force it with a define. Uh, reflect get property set property. Uh, as you know, when you declare a property uh, such as this one, uh, with getter and setter, uh, you will, uh, when you, you uh, use reflect.getField, uh, it will always return you the field value, not, it will not call the getter. That was the behavior before. Actually, it was just a bit wrong on C++, but it was fixed in 2.09. So now, if you want to access uh, a field, or key, which might be a property, then you use reflect.getProperty. And this way, it will call the getter if there is one. And if there is no getter, it will just give you the field that's the same as reflect.field. So um, for a lot of liber libraries that do, for example, twinnings and all, all these kind of things, uh, they can use reflect.getProperty instead of get reflect.getField. And they are sure that if even if the class declare uh, a property, uh, they can uh, access it. Yeah. Something also useful. Uh, we have new sysio and sys.net package because before we had uh, uh, like one package for all the system API. We have we had neko.io, 
Nico.net, we had the C++.io, C++.net, and PHP.io, PHP.net, and there are actually more system language coming on, uh, platform support. So, well, we wanted to clear that. So we have one, one single sysio and sysotin package that contains everything for file access, process handling, host, sockets, everything. Uh, there we kind of replace the whole package. Uh, we have a new sys top level class and sys file system class that also does a lot of, provide a lot of things such as printing, access to the command line and the argument, environment, uh, current blocking directories, calling commands, uh, getting the standard output, uh, input and error. So yeah, all of these are kind of system APIs. Uh, if you are working in Jira in C++, PHP or Neko, uh, and later maybe Java C Sharp, you will be able to get uh, access to all of these with the same API. Uh, so, and also it, it's ready for X3 transition because we have kept the whole API, which is the neco.io uh, and neco.sys and uh, all the php.io file. It's still available in X2.09, but it's planned from removal in X3.0 X3 because we want to have one single package and not uh, like one package per platform. So what we exactly, what we do is that you can compile your code using 2.09. You can compile your code with dash X3 and it will disable all these kind of temporary references from the old package to the new ones. And actually you can kind of, with 2.09 you can uh, actually compile your code as it will compile in X3. I mean from the package, from for this particular uh, package thing. So this way you can actually transit, like do the transition, uh, prepare for transition uh, uh, during this time. Uh, a lot of improvement for JavaScript thanks to Bruno Garcia, which is uh, working on JavaScript, well, doing a lot of work on the JavaScript back end. We have a source mapping with debug. So, s everybody knows about source mapping. Uh, source mapping, what it does is that before when you are compiling JavaScript in debug mode, it was uh, outputting a lot of additional information in JavaScript, which, are soli which were slowly done. Uh, the goal was to be able to kind of get exception stack trace uh, inside the ASHIX files and not inside the JavaScript one. But with uh, no, with source mapping, with uh, you when you compile JavaScript with debug, it will output an additional dot map file. And when you uh, use it, uh, when you debug on Chrome, right now it's only supporting Chrome, but it will be soon in, in Firefox. You will be able to debug directly your Xcode. Okay, so instead of instead of debugging the JavaScript co source code that X compiler output. You directly have all your X classes and you can step into and put the breakpoints and do all the debugging in directly inside your X code. Thanks to source mapping. What source mapping does is just say, okay, this line of JavaScript corresponds to this line in the and this file in the X uh, source. So it's kind of mapping between the two uh, platforms. And it, uh, it's perfectly integrated in Chrome right now, soon in Firefox. So you, be, you, are, you are really able to get really uh, nice uh, and for stack trace, also exception stack trace, you get all the information in your HX files. So that's really something which is uh, really great for debugging JavaScript. I see Nico is happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have modern mode with GS modern. It's also like we are thinking about making that a default for X3.0. So what GS modern does is, is use uh, has use strict, which kind of guarantees there is no like uh, strange things going on. It's have a really strict mode for JavaScript. It wraps all the like JavaScript code into a function wrapper that guarantees there is no globals that are kind of defined. Uh, and you can still expose your class to the uh, global context with arrobas uh, exposed. So this like really modern way of doing JavaScript. Uh, we were asked a lot about this. So it's not available with uh, GS Modern and it will be um, much more, uh, uh, maybe later it will be a default in 3.4, not yet this library. So. Uh, we have on the Flash side, we have new APIs for Flash uh, for the new version of the file support. We have support for binary files this way, so you can just say my files from binary and include a lot of data. And the same for sounds. Uh, we support boy wave and uh, MP3 sounds uh, directly this way for people that want to uh, use Flash backend. And uh, ah, yeah, the Flash 9 directory is not Flash. And the Flash, the old Flash directory which contains the Flash 8 API are not Flash 8, so it makes much more sense this way. <laughs> something we wanted to fix. Uh, there's much more, of course, uh, fix. Uh, like I will not go to all this. Well, there is a lot of things you can see in the release. Uh, well, you will see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, time is flying. <laughs> uh, so, um, plan from battle. 
So now we are, we, we are the presence. We are there, okay? 2.09 is out. Uh, where do we go from there? Uh, so, of course, the next step is 3.0. So <laughs> that's something we wanted to, to do, like, uh, of course, a few. I think we already talked about 3.0 at the last meeting, but uh, it was still a bit in early stage. Now we are already getting, like, ready to start working on it. So now that 2.09 is out, we start working on 3.0. And it should be able, available when it's ready, of course. <laughs> uh, but well, I, it's, we, once we know what we want to put in, I guess that's uh, much more easy. We can go quite quickly and get there. Um, so this is a major release. Uh, the thing that the major release we allow kind of breaks, breaking stuff. Of course, we uh, try to avoid it if it's uh <laughs> if it's smart to do that. Uh, but we still kind of put in the mind that. Uh, we are allowed to break things, uh, to make the code that doesn't compile anymore, and you need to fix some point of your code. Uh, but we don't do this for the fun. We do it to really get things better. So uh, the guidelines to, uh, we, are, we want to follow is like to, to simplify the language. For example, there is a lot of people uh, we saw in the Google groups uh, that say, okay, this one is, uh, this particular feature is hard to use, or I don't understand it correctly. And you have uh, like people, first timers that, uh, start using like they say okay this feature that I don't understand or well what doesn't what doesn't work this way uh, so we, we listen to that so we want to really simplify things uh, and other things uh, of course we want to also avoid like feature bloating like getting too much things into the language that is just become like impossible to learn impossible to uh, to fix and everything so uh, we want it also to make it easier for cross-platform development because that's something X is really shining at this this point uh, both for end users, so when you are a user and you want to adjust, uh, well, when you want to code for cross-platform, it has to be easier, and also it has also easy be to be easier to add new platforms to Axe. Uh, so we also have to think about this carefully. Uh, the thing we consider when you co when you uh, when you want to add a new feature to Axe is uh, uh, first have to have a well-defined behavior. So we have we have to be sure about what we, what kind of feature we want to make, how it will work exactly in the details, in the really small details. Uh, it has to be strictly typed. Uh, two reasons for that. First, because uh, I like it. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's the kind of design of X. It's like, it's nice because it's strictly typed. If you like dynamic typed programming language, like go use something else. <laughs> I think thinking you're, you're not there. Well, anyway, uh, and, and the second point is that uh, as soon as it's strictly typed, it can be very well optimized on all the platforms. Uh, and it can, we, we can get a lot of uh, nice features. When it's not strictly typed, it's just harder to get it right on all the platforms. So, uh, yeah. One of the things that you want to have when you consider a new feature is have to be efficiently uh, able to be emulated on all the platforms. So, because some of the platforms, of course, this already support this particular feature, so it's easy. On some of the platforms, you have like kind of, uh, it's easy to add it. And if you have a feature, for instance, that on some platforms, for example, on, on JavaScript, maybe it will be a bit slower. But as long as it doesn't impact the whole application speed, I mean, as, a, as long as it doesn't uh, prevent uh, to get good speed for all the other things you're using, then it's fine. But if it's as a feature, for instance, uh, some people uh, ask about, uh, what about this particular feature, for example, like operator overloading and things like that. But if we have to do uh, like a check when doing dynamics, say stuff, uh, for every time you want to add two, string, two things together, then it's load on the whole uh, process. So we want to make sure that a new feature doesn't uh, kind of cripple the other like things you are using. So that's something we also want to be sure. Uh, and you have to have good usefulness complexity ratio, so we don't want to put something which are not so much useful, but very complex to add uh, for the platforms. Because we know that Axe will have, have a, a lot of platforms and will have much more in the future. So we don't want at some point to be in a state that adding a new platform is just impossible because there is all these things to do and it, it's so much complex that it doesn't work. So keep it simple, keep it easy, and uh, at the same time uh, get maximum power uh, for the end user uh, with this feature set. Right. Uh, so 
let's go on with the thing we are planning for 3.0. Uh, one of the things is string and interpolation. So basically you will be able to do this thing. Uh, so that's a way with a do $p is a way to reference the uh, p variable, uh, local variable. And you could also like add expression between a curly brace uh, this way. So this just create a string. Uh, and if we just call the method and add them together and return the string. So that's something uh, you can already do that with std.format in 2.09. So if you do std of format of this string, it will return you the like, uh, uh, the, like formatted string. Uh, but uh, it will pass it and do everything and reward you the errors in case there is no p variable. Uh, so, but uh, now we, we want to make it default for all strings to, to work with this. So all strings, will, we be, you will be able to directly write this. Uh, the reason is that right now when you want to do something such as like uh, kind of writing a lot of uh, things, you start writing your text and you say, oh, I need to, to write, to add a variable. So you have the choice either to uh, do a plus, close your string, do a plus, and then open the string again. So that's something uh, like a bit hard to write. Or you can use SLE format, but then you have to come back to the beginning of your line, add the format, and then come back to the end of the string and continue writing. So we want to make it default to make sure that it's, it's, it's kind of uh, compilation time things, so it's uh, really easy to enter. But, uh, simplify properties. So yeah, we get a lot of discussion on the mailing list uh, and the Google groups about properties, how to make them right. So uh, here's a propos proposal for this. Uh, basically, uh, we want to first, there is no really, no really, no really need to uh, be able to specify your getter name uh, because the getter name itself is not very valuable information. Everybody to have uh, his own like standards for that. And I think it's not good. So we will kind of say uh, standardize the name. So you will just say. Uh, property has a getter, so you say get. Has a setter, that it says set. So you not you no longer specify the name of the getter. You just say get and set. And then when you uh, want to add the getter, uh, you use get prop and set prop. Uh, using a underscore is a way to uh, to nicely separate between. Uh, it is a clearly a getter. You uh, there is underscore uh, to separate between the two. Uh, and actually, it's also for people coming from Flash. When you write uh, in Flash getter, it's like function get space, the name of the property. So you just replace a, a space with an underscore, and that's it. <laughs> that's <laughs> pretty much the same. So this is the kind of things we. So we, uh, it's also really good to simplify a reflection because we know that the getter, if it exists, is always get underscore the property name. So we can really uh, check for if there is a property with this name. It's very easy. Uh, and uh, yeah, to also to simplify things. As soon as you declare that, if you declare nothing else, it will automatically create for you uh, uh, the get prop and set prop uh, function. You don't have any more anymore to uh, like kind of write them yourself uh, with uh, nothing. You just do nothing. If you just want to, you just write this and it will generate for this. So that's something also we want to kind of make it easy for properties to uh, to work. And of course, it doesn't create all the like hidden properties if it's a getter default, which means only a read-only variable or something. Well, anyway, uh, we want to uh, add imp import improvement. So this is a very classic one. Uh, <laughs> maybe we should have had this for a long time already. But anyway, <laughs> it will come. <laughs> Wait a little more. And so, well, uh, it was not there before because we are worried about uh, kind of bloating the uh, kind of top level uh, namespace. But well, you could impro import everything now. And uh, you could also import statics. Uh, when you do, uh, I want to import ev all the statics of my jQuery class as globals. So this way you will be able to have uh, globals in your class. For example, let's say that gs.jQuery has a, a G, uh, G co constructor that is uh, actually uh, a way to say new return new jQuery of the parameter. This way, as soon as you import gs.jQuery.star, you will be able to say g of my request dot, and you have a jQuery. So that's really simplify things uh, uh, to uh, really be able to kind of build libraries that give you top level uh, variables uh, for your program. So that's something you want. So for instance, you can also import a very specific uh, function. So if you import x dot 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 trace, you will have a top level trace that 
well, I mean, you already have that, <laughs> but that's a way to show you how it will work. Uh, right now, you have a top level address. It will be the same as if you write x import x dot 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 trace. Okay, that's a way to add new like top level methods, whatever you are. Uh, we also want uh, have a lot of requests for kind of be able to. A lot of people they have all the like libraries and they have to write all these imports for every file they every file they, they create. So what we will do is we allow default import dot uh, which is a, a file that is it's per project. So in your project, if you have this file, it means that it will contain all the imports and using declaration that you you put inside there, they will be automatically imported in all your files of your project. So this way you write it once, all the import default import there in this file, and automatically it's available on all your files. So some things also that really helps to uh, like kind of scale when you have a lot of libraries and you want to use. And uh, actually libraries will be able to use it also, because for instance, let's say the enemy will be able to define the enemy imports.hx, which contain all the default imports when you are using enemy. And as soon as, as, soon as you include uh, the enemy lib library, you will be able to use uh, in all your files all the imports that are already done for you. So it's a way to really like kind of you just do an uh, you just use enemy and you can access to all the enemy like values directly without having to import everything. So that's something you want to really uh, kind of get quickly to the pl to the point when you actually write code and less setup. Maybe the library does a setup for you and then you're done. You just have to write code. Using we also imply import or something small to want to do. Uh, we are planning also a replacement for callback. How many you people know about callback and are using it? Uh, quite a lot, okay. Because some people are like a callback. Is it in the documentation somewhere? <laughs> so I, uh, I ask that a lot. So well, we want to actually re replace it to make it much, much more understandable. Uh, so right now, when you create a callback, you will see that this. Okay, on click is a, like a fill or something. It's callback function, and they say callback uh, click element E, or E is a variable that you capture, it's like uh, the element on which which is clicked. And uh, so this kind of thing you write, and uh, we want to transform it to this. Uh, basically, as soon as you use an underscore uh, into, uh, into a local, uh, uh, into a function call, it will say return a function that all the underscores are, are kind of Re replaced by some for variable, so <laughs> it, it will be the same as callback uh, this way, and uh, it's just more natural to write. Uh, it doesn't. It also play well with completion because before you will have to kind of uh, you write callback and then your function and your arguments in a separate list. So this way you get completion when you open the like parentheses. You can kind of see what arguments are required, and you just replace the arguments that you want to apply later with underscores. And this will create a function that contains the arguments that will be applied later. So, yeah, and can also be, you can also reverse, for instance, which cannot, you cannot do with callback. When you do callback, you will just apply the first two or three arguments and uh, keep the remaining ones. With a new uh, way of writing, you will be able to say, I want to, this one, I want to take as a parameter for my function. So on click will pass this parameter, and this one is fixed already. So it's something like running on. A more switch. Uh, so we want to add a guard so you can check this thing. So I want to switch on something. Uh, in case a x, so this is a switch on an enum, and if x is more than zero, then we go into this case. But if it's not, we go on to the next one. Then we can switch on case minus one. If it's minus one, then we go on this case. I, if not, we go to the next one, and so on. I know maybe sometimes some more complex things that are B, C, L, O, false, which is a quite bit complex structure, then we go in this case. And in case it's not none of this, then uh, we get default. And here, uh, someone something, something we want to make it optional, of course, is to be able to catch the value that was switched. Uh, because sometimes you have to move it into a temporary variable. So this way you get you get the default value, which was uh, the return result of getting value. So that's something like that. Well, small, small improvements uh, for switching. So that's 
some part of the thing we want to make for 2.0. And uh, yeah, uh, just change. And, uh, but not all, we want to really move forward. Uh, so we want to have new targets. I think you should come to Corey. I, I think you will come anyway to Corey talks tomorrow about uh, new targets we are planning for Axe, uh, C Sharp and Java. Uh, more libraries, more tools. Uh, we have IntelliJ uh, ID plugin, people are working on that. Uh, we have NME plus, uh, plus three and plus. Uh, new XP. Well, and a new, a new t lot of tools that are necessary for improving Axe. And uh, yeah, contribute. That's important, that's a key word there. Uh, it's not something that uh, everybody can really help with that. It's not something that uh, uh, a few people are already contributing, I mean, more and more every day. And uh, I think it's nice to have as many people contributing to the, uh, to the code test. Styles, oops. Classes, HTML and text content, properties, and so on. So this is basically what jQuery does with a different kind of style. What is very powerful in DHX and D3, where this inspiration wha where it comes, is the data building. Okay. So before uh, taking a look at the data building, I want to show you a little snippet of code using DHX. In this case, I'm selecting a, an existing div element inside my page. I'm appending an SVG element to it and defining its size. Then I iterate 100 times, adding circles. And the circles have a, a random center, so random x, y coordinates, random radius, and uh, a set of styles, opacity, fill, and stroke. And this is the result, nothing, nothing special there. I, maybe I was too fast? I don't know, okay. <laughs> so what is data binding? Data binding is essentially pairing your data sets to the DOM elements of your, of your visualizations. So in this case, I have a very simple array of integers, and I want to pair those data to my DOM. Uh, how do I do that? I actually start from my SVG container, or any kind of element. This applies to HTML or whatever elements you have. I do a select all circle, meaning this is a CSS selector. I want all the elements that are of the type circle. And I associate the data in the array to those circles. So what happens? If those circles do not exist yet, I have an enter option. And in the enter option, I create those elements. So I create for each of those four items, I create one circle. And the circle will have <coughs> several properties, which the first one is the X coordinate. And I'm saying, use the position in the data set to define the position on the X axis. So I'm saying multiply the position by 200 and add an offset of 100 pixels. So they will be distributed horizontally. Then I have a CY and R um, property, and those are associated to this H scale function. The H scale function is a, a real scale for behave, and they are defined using this linear uh, scale function. So a linear scale takes a domain and a range. The domain is the values I have inside my, my data set, and the range are, is the um, pixel mapping I want to produce. So I want to, produce, I want to map those values, those integers values, to a range of uh, zero to 100 pixels. And I use those as the coordinates of my two attributes. And then I have a simple field. And this is the effect. So I'm distributing on the x-axis, and I'm saying that the radius and the position of the circle is proportional to this uh, scale and the data. So now I have created a binding between one and this circle, two and this circle, four and this circle, and eight and this circle. What is nice is that uh, I can, I will get back to them later, I can also define other actions besides enter. So if I have a data set, and this data set changes over time, I can update the information inside in, of my DOM. So if I change my data set, uh, I will not, so the element already exists but changes its value, I will skip the enter phase and I will only go to the update phase. And in the update phase I will do something, right? now we will see. If the element is removed from the data set, 
I will go in the exit phase. And in the exit phase, I can, for example, remove the element from the DOM. So this way, I can create a very linear uh, interaction between data and, 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 the, and the DOM. And I can easily map uh, values from uh, my data points to, to, to the DOM. So in, in this uh, small example, what I'm doing is basically, again, circles. I like circles. Circles are nice because they are defined just by three coordinates, the center and, and the radius. That's why I'm using those. If you are an infographic expert, you know that it's wrong to use the circles because circles are really hard to read. Circles use the area to define a value, and the human perception is not very good at comparing areas. So you, if you want to use this, don't use circles. Use bar charts, use lines, don't use circles unless you want to present and it's easy, circles are easy. So in this case, the example shows that I'm, I have a random function which creates an object that has the x, y, and various properties, a stroke width and a color. All of those properties are basically random and I will not go into details of that. And then we have a timer that is triggered every 100 millise milliseconds. What happens when the timer is triggered? Happens that 25% of the times an element from the data set will be removed. 75% of the times, unless uh, I am over the maximum values of uh, maximum amount of uh, circles, 75% of the times a new element will be added to the data set. Otherwise, the existing one of the existing elements will be changed. And the effect of all this effort is something that doesn't work. No, it does. It's here. So uh, nice board that moves and do stuff. Why do they move? We have we haven't defined anything to move those yet. But DHX has a nice support for sorry. For transitions, so instead of just applying in the update the new styles or new position, I'm saying I'm saying that I should not click on that object. Okay, I'm saying here. Oh, <laughs> I'm saying I will move the mouse here, so I will not click on it. Uh, that I want to apply a transition, so the elements are actually change it over time instead of at, uh, in just one step. And transition takes parameters like delay that you can find here, or you can uh, use different equations for the transition for uh, easing effects. But as you can see, we are all ani animating only the center and the radius, but in the animation, also the color is animated. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't, but you can see that some of the moving things are changing colors. So that animation comes actually from CSS. That's why I like it, because it's transparent and it's easy. And that transition is done just by that code. So it's very easy to add the transition to C uh, using CSS, extremely easy. Let's close this, this, and this. For this presentation, I've prepared another visualization that actually uses more meaningful data, not just random points. Again, using circles, because they are easy. The visualization is this. I have a JSON. Can I close this? No. License, free licenses. So, I'm using Sublime Text a lot. It's a very nice editor. I really hope to switch to Mono Develop soon because the completion in a Sublime Text is not as good as, as good as I'd like, but the editor per se is fantastic. If I only can put it in my screen. Almost there. Okay. 
So here I'm loading a JSON object which contains information about sur plastic surgery. I'm loading it and I'm uh, using, this is scientific, don't it, please. <laughs> so I've built uh, just uh, three classic, uh, classes. One is for the a controller that controls the start year and the end year I want to compare in my visualization, in my infographics. Then I have a BCHAR class that defines using not a very dry syntax, but I wanted to in keep it exploded so it was read it, uh, easy to read. So it defines the, the, the visualization itself. And I'm using some CSS styles to actually style it. And the result is this nice visualization that doesn't fit the skin. And you can click on the controls and see that between the year 2001 and 2004, augmentations has, uh, uh, has rise about 20%, reductions decreased by 14%, and lifts are uh, up by 37%. So you can play around with that. You can compare visually. Again, circles are not good to compare, but in this case, they were essential. <laughs> and you can play around with that as much as you like. So, what are the main differences between D3 and DHX? Of course, the first uh, big difference is the, the syntax. So in uh, D3, you use a very JavaScript-like approach. In X, you, we want to be more precise. Uh, so when you want to set an attribute, you use the jQuery style of using multiple arguments. So you use the same function attribute to, as a setter, as a getter and as a setter for different types. In the DHX implementation instead, you first capture the attribute you want to uh, manipulate, and then you use one of the specific functions that are associated to that. So for an attribute, you can use float, string, or if you, are, if you have already performed a data binding, you can associate that to a float function, for example. And the getter is symmetrical, so instead of just returning the value of this, you use get float or get string or what or get what you need. So all this work went into the production of a report grid, which is a visualization uh, engine. And this visualization engine has some pretty unique stuff again, free resolution. Not good. Next time we need to agree on what is the standard <laughs> resolution for this. So this is a Sankey. In a, our approach, we decided that we wanted all of our with visualization to be very easy to implement. All the API is the JavaScript, is not X. There is not a public hex uh, library. So it's all written in hex, but is exposed as a JavaScript API. And all the code that is uh, required to build that Sankey is just that. And actually, this option could al also be removed, and it will still work. Of course, there is more data, there is more uh, code, then, but this is only the data that is used to build the, the visualization. Visualization are interactive, so you can associate events to the nodes. And this association is not associated to the visual entities, but the data. So if I click on one of these nodes, I get back the data point that has generated that, 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 uh, that node, not the coordinates of the, the mouse, which are not interesting most of the time. We have, you can customize a lot of stuff, like in this case is another Sankey with uh, thumbnail images and uh, in different style for edges that comes back that goes back, same visualization, but with the edges not reduced and no thumbnails. Then we have geocharts. Let's see if this was supposed to go floating. That, that direction is not floating anywhere, but so I need to scroll up and down. Again, geographic visualization are extremely easy to code. So to build this, you just add those information. We have uh, some predefined 
um, team pla templates that like the USA states or, or world counties, stuff like that. And all of these definitions are actually shortcuts to GeoJSON file. So you, if you have your GeoJSON file, you can use your own solutions. And you can go as complex as you like. For example, in this case, I have uh, three layers of geographical information, one for the states, one for the state counties, and one for the state centroids. And each of these layers is associated to a different data set. Actually, it's the same data set, but different data points. Then we have other atypical visualization, like the funnel chart. The funnel chart is really nice to convey information about conversions. This is obviously fictional because no one will ever convert 6% from 100% impressions, but it will be nice. So usually this is a very thin line, almost invisible. <laughs> and again, the code to produce those animation is really, really easy. And again, you can customize. I'm sorry for this scrolling, which is not nice. This is what I call the Christmas tree chart which is the opposite of the funnel chart. And then you can flatten things. Then we have more classic visualization like the heat map. Again, you can customize a lot of stuff there. Bar chart, this is really bad. And bar charts can be stacked or not, can have a multiple Y axis, can have reels, can have a lot of options that you find in most libraries. Another pretty unique visualization is the, is the string graph, which you can figure out like a pie chart exploded over time. Then we have line charts. You can have several y-axis for the line charts. You can have more than two. Usually doesn't make much sense to have more than two y-axis, but you can if you want. Pie charts, donut charts all of those nice charts that we all know. Then we have pivot tables, which are really nice because tables usually convey information only on two dimensions, and pivot table convey information about three or more dimensions. In this case, I have one dimension over the columns and two dimensions on the rows. And with this pivot table, you can quickly switch from two dimensions on the columns and one dimensions on the rows. So it's very easy to make those kind of transformations. You set your axis, your dimensions, and you say how many dimensions you want in the columns, and that's all. And then finally, we have a very simple leaderboard, which is essentially a, an ordered list of values, so nothing special here. But it's nice because it's quick to code, and you don't have to think. So back to the presentation. Let's say five. Okay. <laughs> Back to the presentation. So there are other libraries that work with SVG. Uh, usually they don't aim to be used inside the browser, so they are not really competitors to these libraries. They are just used for other stuff, like GMTD uses SVG uh, for assets. Hydrax, which uses a G the GMTD engine and expands that. XIF, which is unfortunately not very much used, but is a very powerful library. DOM tools is not doing anything about SVG, but could, because SVG element can be seen as HTML elements. So you can use probably DOM tools to manipulate SVG. I'm not sure it supports namespaces yet, but it's a simple addition, so it's something we should think about. And NX also uses SVG as native format. If you want to explore more options, there are a lot of libraries out there using JavaScript as the base. D3 is, of course, the first one. Paper.js is an exceptional library that works on Canvas, not SVG. But uh, there, I there are plans to add a backend for SVG. And Paper.js has a really, really nice way to be to express geometries and to design charts. Then you have a processing JS, which is a porting from Java or processing. 
Doge of VFX, which is nice because abstracts the, the drawing library from the context. It's completely abstracted. So uh, using this, uh, this library, you can uh, actually draw on canvas, SVG, uh, Silverlight, and um, I'm missing one, VML. And Raphael, which uses SVG and VML as rendering engines. And I think there is uh, an, an external library for Hex that uh, wraps Raphael. If you are in need of legacy solutions, so if you need to support Internet Explorer, <laughs> you have two options, server-side uh, server rendering using solutions like PhantomJS or uh, VKHTML to PDF or to image. We are using actually VKHTML to PDF to do this in our library. So if you open one of our visualization without a proper browser, it should render as a static image using this service. Or on the client side, you can always use the Google Chrome frame, which is a nice way to work around the Internet Explorer limitation. Actually, there is another player that doesn't play well with SVG and is called Android until version four, before version four, uh, SVG was not supported at all. So there are a lot of mobile devices that will not work with SVG, not just Internet Explorer. And that will be all, I guess. <laughs> Any question? Where what? D2? No, I don't know. What is D2? D uh, D3? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, they are. All on GitHub. Yes, it's all on GitHub. DHX and THX are on GitHub. There are no D3 bindings. This is all ported. This is all X code. No, no, no externs here. That's because when I, th I see at the D3 library, I see a lot of stuff that can be used outside the JavaScript uh, context. And I love what is there, but I cannot use it because if I use externs, I cannot use it in Nico or I cannot use it in Flash. So I decided to port everything. I didn't actually port everything. I ported what I needed as usual. But is a lot of stuff. Okay. There was a question mark there. But I tried uh, also to uh, make classes and uh, I made webs. Can you speak a little louder because I cannot really hear you? I, uh, I was saying that uh, I used your your, your library, okay. library and I tried to make uh, to move groups from uh, group uh, SVG. I made graphics uh, in a SVG editor, but I couldn't use it uh, with uh, the same library. That's strange. Because are you using the G tag for the creating groups? Yeah. And uh, are you using the transform, the transform uh, attribute? I don't remember, but. Because G has a very limited subset of attributes, and basically you can only use transform. So you can only transform a G with using transform. And transform can be a little tricky because you need to chain the tra transformations, so you add a scale, for example, before a, a, a translation, a rotation. So might be that. We, we can check that later if you want. But, but <laughs> possible to make math in a, in a graphic editor, to make textures, and animate them uh, with your library? Possible? I, 
I think so, yes. No more questions? Free to go. No, I don't know. Yep. Um, that li uh, library you can use in your own application? Or? If I'm using that in my application? No, can, can I, as a developer, use it? Yes, yes, you can use it. It's free for any com commercial or non commercial use usages if you go branded. If you want to remove the brand, you have to pay. But otherwise, it's absolutely free. And when will you release next uh, line? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you should ask my boss. <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? You didn't mention another thing. Yes. I think that D3 is a superior because you can go very low level in defining what you need. Uh, but it's also a limitation because you don't have an abstract way to deal with graphics. So you, I think you just need to, you just, uh, need to select what you really need because if you want to real, uh, uh, go deep inside your visualization, D3 is the best, in my opinion. But if you want to support different targets, that will not work, unless there is SVG everywhere, support everywhere, and that's not the case. So it really depends on what you want to do. Yeah? Apart from Internet Explorer, um, did you find any cross-platform <laughs> cross-browser problems between uh, the SVG implementation? The main thing, is, the main disappointment for me was the SVG filter support, because we wanted to add some uh, line effects like uh, drop shadows on the chart, which are useless but nice, and people want them. And so I used the SVG filter, and only after I discovered that Firefox was not supporting them. But that was not the main problem. The main problem was that performances were really bad, really bad. So what we ended to do was actually duplicating the element several times, giving it different opacities, and faking the drop shadow. And that works a lot better. So. SVG filters is probably the main. Only, only a subset. And they are pretty specified. You cannot add a new filter. You cannot add a blur effect and hoping that it will work. Actually, you can, but it's not implemented in the library. You should do that apart. OK. Okay. No questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Franco. Bravo.
Parce que Raph l'a débranché l'écran quand même. Euh, il doit y avoir un écran là. Euh, voilà. Il doit y avoir un truc. Ouais, voilà, ça faut que tu le branches euh, sur, le, sur le PC. Ça va Ah oui. Alors. <coughs> bah vas-y, hein. je pense que tu peux le voir. Ok. Non, il n'y a pas de souris sur celui-là non plus. Ah, ça l'a fait. C'est bon Je suis en train de bouger ça, tu sais. One two one two. One two one two. Test test. carrément hein. c'est la répète euh, je ne sais pas si on m'entend Camille tu m'entends tu m'entends bien ou pas là Cravate. C'est bon là Est-ce qu'on entend Ça va Non, moi bah, je m'entends pas du tout. Ok.
pas le code à partir d'ici ou peut-être un peu zoomé. Là, c'est bon. C'est bien là okay. Camille, t'es ok aussi <coughs> Ouais, on va attendre un peu. C'est 11h30, on est en avance. Ouais, mais. Ouais, je sais pas. On ouais, a un quart d'heure de plus pour manger. Bon, on a qu'à aller. Euh... Okay, so Yannick will uh, sing a song <laughs> because we <laughs> are. Uh, <laughs> it's too early. Okay, so we will make a small um, break before we begin because we we are supposed to respect a little bit the schedule. We're a bit, uh, we're a bit early, so we're going to go back. Uh, thanks back to for 11:30. Uh, okay, so you have 10 minutes if you want to smoke a coffee or drink a cigarette. 